Okay. Hello and welcome to the Colts Cover 2 podcast. I'm Joel A. Erickson. I'm joined as always by Nate Atkins. These Wednesday pods are not normally supposed to be first impressions pods, but they are. <laughs> this one is. Uh, I have, We've only had a couple hours to think about this now. Where is your head? What's the first thing your head goes to? What? Are you saying there was news today? Is this, yeah. Did something happen? Yep. Oh yeah. I'm I'm assuming everybody on everyone listening to this pod already knows what's going on. Probably. Um, unless you've been living under a rock. Anthony Richardson is back. Back from the dead, baby. Uh it's been two weeks, uh, which around here is usually the time frame for these. If you remember two years ago they benched Matt oh. Ryan. Two weeks they started Sam Ellinger, went back to Matt Ryan. Here we are back in that mode. But uh, but this is a different feel. This is not um this this is renewed optimism, renewed faith in the quarterback that they still hope is the one of the future. And I certainly will get into some of the reasons. I think it's fair to remain skeptical on a lot of fronts. And uh, certainly the messaging has been strange. The process has been strange. And still we have, obviously, there's a lot that has to be proven on Anthony Richardson's side and Shane Steichen's side and this team's side to get this to work. But they are at least... Uh, the way I frame, the way I kind of think about this is like when I, coming out of the game, I wrote about how um, the Colts have a decision to make when they go up against the Josh Allen and they lose as thoroughly as they did on Sunday. They can either go back in the lab of trying to create a Josh Allen, knowing how hard that is, knowing how most of the the, the attempts aren't going to work in this league, knowing that it's going to get scary at times, but knowing what it can become. Or they can just forever look up to Josh Allen in the AFC because that's what they're up against with Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow. Uh, they're back in the lab. They're back to trying to do whatever they can to tap into a quarterback who's got very special traits, obviously has a ton to work on uh, that we'll get into both on the field as a quarterback, you know, off the field, in the building, all that kind of stuff is, is kind of what's what's come to light over the past couple of weeks uh, that, that Anthony Richardson needs to work on, and that the Colts need to find a way to to help him through and then and then develop. But you know, they hopped off a roller coaster after ten games, and I remember sitting on this podcast two weeks ago, wondering whether they would have the courage to get back on that roller coaster that scared them enough to hop off of it. Uh, that's not normally how it works, but. They decided this week that, that they're going to do it, I think, because I think they kind of saw this as like one of the last opportunities to do this and not have it be just a total act of desperation that no one can believe in. They had to get Anthony Richardson. They had to get him back out there before they've squandered any hope of him believing that they believe in him, uh, which right now they're four and six. They're mathematically right in it in the AFC. They've got a winnable game this week. Uh, tough defense they're up against, but the Jets are going through a lot. It's right there for them, but it's they have a nice balance it, right now, at least, of either you know they can either find a way to make this work and get to the playoffs, but if they don't, and if they stick to their promise of sticking with this, we should at least get answers on whether Anthony Richardson is the quarterback of the future for this team. And I think one of those had to happen uh, it, for this season to be any kind of a success and been weird but they're back in the lab and back having a chance at either one of those do you think anyone's actually lived under a rock uh, and how and how would that work that would be tough um, it's a weird it's a weird it's a weird idiom it is it's like they're talking about maybe like a it's like a troll under a bridge maybe those people are like the closest i understand living under a bridge like it wouldn't be great, but like you could tuck yourself up under the bridge. How does one live under a rock? Well, would you like dig out a hobbit. hole under the rock? Yeah, if it's a hole under the rock, that's kind of like you're a hobbit, basically. So maybe the hobbit did. That's like the is one. That what is that what hobbits did? Uh, I mean, it was kind of like I. I do not know much about about Lord of the Rings. I'm going to be honest; it's not my cup of tea. Yeah, hobbit. Um, it wasn't exactly a rock, but it was that sort of concept of be out there uh yeah, my takeaway there. my biggest takeaway is just however we got here and 
I do think that maybe this moves at the timetable on the evaluation some. Um, but however we got here, we're back to where the season was supposed to be. Yeah. Um, I also think, well, do you believe them when they say that Joe Flacco's play has nothing to do with this? No. <laughs> I, I, Joe Flacco doesn't believe that. I thought he made that very obvious today. He wasn't all confused and baffled and felt like <clears throat> betrayed on a word or didn't understand this. He felt bad that he played the way he did and that it slipped away, that the moment slipped away from him. Uh, you know, I, I honestly think when they decided to do this, the thought process, because we're learning over time now some of the reasons, a lot of stuff behind the scenes. But I think at the time they thought if they put Joe Flacco in, they'll have a fighting chance and a very tough stretch of four games, but then they'd have all these easier opponents so that they could make the playoffs and they can make this development process for Anthony last as long as they need to this season. Or if they make the playoffs, yeah, some people are upset about it, but hey, the team's not going to be upset if they make the playoffs. Anthony can learn behind this quarterback who's playing well and, and winning games and showing you what that looks like. It just wasn't working at all. It, nothing from the past two games. I, mean, even, I don't even say the past three starts. If you go back to Joe Flacco's first game against the Titans, there's just no way you can talk yourself into that offense getting to the playoffs, I don't think. And I understand the schedule is going to get easier, but the way that they've been playing – where they've essentially – Kevin Bowen laid this out, I thought, very nice in the radio. We looked at the drives that the Colts had on offense with Joe Flacco. He took out the last one against the Bills because there were like 12 seconds left and the Bills weren't even really rushing the passer. But he said if you take out that one garbage time drive, they had – I think it was 14 possessions and one touchdown drive uh, going to Joe Flacco in two weeks. It's, it's just not going to make the playoffs that way. So they were going to lose the short-term – goals and short-term boost of energy that they wanted to get from this while also not learning about the long term that was the worst of both worlds so i think they finally realized that this week it's unfortunate that, that it's gone this way for joe who certainly wanted to play and he wanted to recreate you know the, the run he had with the browns last year but it just it didn't work to the level that gave them any real benefit or argue, really any leg to stand on for keeping Anthony Richardson on the bench. Because it started out, we're trying to make the playoffs. Joe gives us the best chance to win. And we, as we felt, as we saw in these press conferences that have been really tough with Shane Steichen the past two times before today, there just was no argument anymore for Joe Flacco gave them, gives them the best chance to win or that you look at this offense right now and think, this is a team that's going to go to the playoffs and certainly not one that's going to make any noise in it. So I think the timing of it is directly related to back past two games have gone the way they did on offense. Yeah. I, I was asked this, I, I, I was, I was asked this question on the radio and someone said, how does this affect the win now part of it? And I was like, I don't think it does because like Richardson was not playing well. Their, their offense wasn't uh, converting enough first downs. wasn't staying on the field enough. wasn't completing enough passes, but Flacco wasn't playing well. He turned the ball over six times. They couldn't run the ball. Short throws, uh, very little down the field. Alec Pierce somehow went four games without a catch of, without an explosive pass pass play, despite leading the NFL in reception or in yards per reception. Like it was a very limited offense. And so the idea that you know somebody asked, I think somebody, I think maybe Jake Arthur, somebody asked today. You know, you said you wanted to go to. Uh, to Shay or to, to to Joe Flacco because you wanted to it was the best thing for the team to win games. Is that still true? And Shane said, we still want to win games. And I think the reality is Flacco wasn't helping them do that. So if if your passing game is going to be high completion percentage, but just as ineffectual as it was when you weren't completing a lot of passes, you might as well go to the young guy who gives you upside and also gives you a running game because they're, they're, that's another problem with this team is that they can't, for some reason, they can't get a running game going unless they have a mobile quarterback on the field. Yeah. I think when you look at the two offenses, obviously there's been quarterback issues with either guy passing game issues. Uh, but with, 
with Anthony Richardson, when he's been out there, the that offense as a whole has been a lot of ups and downs, like a lot of explosive moments and some great moments in the run game, and obviously some very down moments of you know three and outs or turnovers. With Joe Flacco, you lost almost all the upside. They weren't explosive in the run game outside of they've had one run that Jonathan Taylor ripped off for 50-some yards against the Bills. They don't have the consistent of the C of the run game either. They don't have any explosiveness in the passing game either. So their whole offense was built on just kind of get completions and move down the field. But then then what finishes off the drives? That's how they have that one touchdown drive out of 14 that we laid out. So you're deciding if you're just in a football – how do we win mode? Would you rather have an offense that has some great plays and some terrible ones, highs and low moments with Anthony Richardson, or would you rather have a moment, an offense with Joe Flacco that does not have any high moments and still has a good number of low moments with the turnovers we saw on Sunday, four turnovers against the Bills, essentially five with the fourth down they went for. Um, that's kind of that's kind of where it was at. And I think also – it's interesting to me. I don't know if this factored in, but it certainly is factored into how I've thought about things. When Julian Blackman said what he did to you uh, on Sunday about we need to figure out what our team identity is, and Kenny mm-hmm. Moore made mention of that. It's it is interesting to look at like what was this team's plan to win with with where they were at with the thirty nine year old quarterback. Given here's the thing, it's not all Joe's fault. I think if you remember like when people were kind of excited for Joe Flacco, it was that Jaguars game. And yes, the Jaguars defense played a lot into that, but they did put up 34 points in explosive plays. But two things happened in that game that I think have have really hurt the model, if that's what they wanted to be, which is two injuries. They lost Will Fries to a fractured tibia, and Michael Pittman Jr. re-aggravated his back. So your number one outside wide receiver can't be that guy anymore, the guy to go win on fourth and two against press man coverage like they faced two straight weeks. And they don't have their best pass protecting interior or a, a high level pass protector, maybe the second best pass protector between Pine Quinn and Nelson. So now they're playing an undrafted rookie in that spot. They don't have they don't have the settings to be a drop back pass team right now, not at a high level. And that's even understanding that like Alec, you know, not in a too high shell world, at least when, when that's where Alec Pierce is kind of getting run into too often. So uh here we go. We got some cameo from Watley again. I love it. Uh, we'll get my cameo from Grady here soon. Uh, but yeah, I just think in a football sense, when you're looking for an identity, like what's this team's going to be imperfect. It, it just is. But what's sort of a way that we can approach each game and, and have a chance? And I think the run game has to be that right now is that you put Anthony Richardson in there, you play him next to Jonathan Taylor. You lean into those two, and that's been another side of this. They've gone away from Jonathan Taylor in the second half of basically every game. They've got to get back to trusting that. But I think if you just ride those two on a team that has Quentin Nelson up front that plays two blocking tight ends and then has a play caller that can design some uh, some some tricky and interesting and creative run plays, uh, I think that – you know. There's a way you can look at that and think that even with all the concerns of the passing game, that may be enough to get to the playoffs. We will see. But I think I, I do think that when they go up against teams like the Jets, Jaguars, Titans, and Giants, and Patriots, it, it feels like that game they played in Tennessee where it's a race to 20 points. I think Jonathan Taylor dominating with some Anthony Richardson could be enough in those games. If you win enough of those games, you got a shot at the playoffs. I at least see that path without with Joe Flacco back there, not having that same run game and not having the explosive pass plays. It was just really hard to, for me to see a path where that offense was going to win enough of those games, even, even against subpar teams to get to the postseason. So I, I think they've got a, a chance now, whereas I think before, um, you could only kind of fool yourself into thinking they had a chance. Yeah, I mean, if they're going to make the playoffs, Richardson's got to be a lot better as a passer, I think. Um, I mean, and, you know, a lot better as a passer doesn't mean he has to be completing 67% of his passes. But, like, even 55 would be an 11% jump, you know. Um I guess I'm not convinced on that because they're they're three and three with Richardson this year, completing 44. percent Their three losses are to 
Texans, Texans, and Packers. And the rest of the way, they only face one good team. Maybe you could argue a second in the Broncos. Depends on how you want to look at them. But I honestly think their run game and occasional explosive plays, with the way they're playing defense right now, I think that could be enough in the majority of these games to get to nine and eight, which I think in this AFC is good enough to go to the playoffs. Maybe. Maybe. Um, you know, the like – the, as bad as the last two games were, the game against Houston, like they almost came back and won that one, but they also got themselves behind and he put like he put him in a hole with the interception. So like I, I just think he needs he needs to be a little bit better as a passer to to oh, really sure. make it stick. Um, but he doesn't have to be. But but I I would much I think I just like you were getting completions from Flacco, but so many of them were short completions. Uh, I think the other thing was just like the missed situational stuff from Flacco, mm-hmm. taking sacks when you're in field goal range, um, trying to throw downfield to Michael Pittman Jr. on third and two when Trey Sermon is standing all by himself in the flat. Uh, forced, forced, uh, it, it just situationally just wasn't very good. Um, and it, it kind of, it just negated the argument in terms of having them play right away. Um, Richardson, like, like we said, I, I, two weeks is probably not enough to turn him into a, a you know, 65% completion player. If it's 55 or 59, and if you're getting more, if, if he's taking more completions that are shorter and maybe not forcing so many down and, and you get the same amount of explosive plays without so many of the incompletions, there's there like I think you like you said there's a real path you know for them for this offense to be better and this offense was getting pretty bad you know we were talking about this yesterday before we knew this was going to go on but they hadn't scored more than 20 points in their last five games um and that's just not going to get it done <laughs> there's no yeah. way around it now they've been playing good defenses for the most part but yeah. But I think but yeah, the Cardinals are only 25 games. In those five games, I mean, they've, they've gone between the two quarterbacks, and, and you can blame both of them for some of it. Those five games coincide from that Jaguars game when they lost Will Fries and Michael Pittman Jr., essentially. So I think that's been a big part of this. They don't have as good of offensive personnel, and so more of the focus goes on the quarterback and the his ability to win around that without the elite – right guard pass protector without that wide receiver one. And so the sack yeah. avoidance is going to help a lot. Yeah. Yeah. The sack yeah. avoidance I think is a big deal because I felt like part of Flacco's decision making at times was knowing that he can't get out of anything. I thought he threw too quick out of some fairly clean pockets and I think that there, some of it was just knowing he's not really escapable anymore. Whereas Richardson Richardson, the one thing I think the thing he probably does best as a thrower right now is avoid sacks. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I also think like in those some of the situations, I think back to the fourth and two on Sunday where the Colts, they had a really clean pocket and Joe Flacco just held it, held it, held it, and held it and took the sack for like 13 yards. Didn't really try to move around because he probably knows that that's not really the most feasible thing for him. But in that same situation, say the same thing happens with the way that the play is covered. Your hope with Anthony Richardson is that you have one extra step in the progression of that kind of play, which is take off and scramble. And so you look at like Jalen Hurts on 2021 was his first year with Shane Steichen, similar ish spot to where Anthony started this year, uh, where he was 52% past the year before starting four games no one knew he was as a passer. But that year, uh, he was able to get 56 first downs uh, just with his legs. So it's just some of that. Stay on the field a little bit more because right now what's happening is the Colts are in a lot of these games and the fourth quarter arrives and their defense that's been fighting and fighting and getting some turnovers, they just kind of fall apart. But the plays are adding up to such a crazy degree. I think you had some of the numbers on, what is it, like 100 more plays? It is 712. I gotta look up my gotta look up my file. Yep, 712 plays the defense has faced. 
The offense is face 607. Um, for those yeah. of you who don't know, I have a Excel file on my computer that I've kept ever since I started here. It's got every snap for every game. Well, offense and defense for players. I don't have a full season. I know it's only seven seasons, but I don't have a full season where there's that big of a discrepancy between offense and defense. Like yeah. 100, 105 play difference at this point in the season is really, really remarkable. Yeah. And so that's like the defense has been talking about, Gus Bradley just said it this week, that they have made a lot of strides since things were not looking good those first five games. And there's a lot of areas we can point to that are better as far as they're bringing some pressure in the blitzes. They're getting those turnovers. They're making teams drive the field and not punch it in because of the turnovers. The pass rush with DeForest Buckner and some other guys is, is, is flashing. But by the fourth quarter, they're giving up long touchdown drives. Well, that's also when I think all those plays add up. I mean, the Bills drive down and the Vikings drive down for these long drives and the defense is just gassed. So what do you do about that? Well, I don't look at that as the def- – early in the season, the defense wasn't getting off the field, so they were – the reason they played a lot, but lately it's been the offense. And I just think if, if the Colts run, if they finally run the Jalen Hurts style offense, which is heavy quarterback, a good amount of quarterback run, but heavy run in general, and then build the pass concepts off of a run first approach, at the very least, I think they're staying on the field a lot more. They're getting those first downs with Anthony Richardson scrambling. What are you going to Jonathan Taylor, who – like two straight games has hit 100 yards on like 13 carries and then basically doesn't get the ball again. Uh, he had five carries after halftime last week. Like that's, I think they got to lean into the strengths of how their roster is built. Uh, certainly presently with Pittman still hurt, no Will Fries. I mean, if they just lean into Jonathan Taylor and Anthony Richardson, it may not be a, per, it's not going to be a perfect offense. It may not even be a great offense, but I think it will be an offense that stays on the field and manages these situations and doesn't put their defense in spots where they're gassed at the end of the game. And maybe then there's a couple games against these compromised offenses they're facing where the defense can be the team, the side of ball that wins it rather than the one that's trying to hang in, hold a deficit at bay, and then ends up breaking at the end of the game. I think this is a good week to, to test that out against – a, an offense in disarray with the Jets is that I just think if you stay on the field, if you can get, let's say, two touchdown drives, if you can force the Jet Aaron Rodgers, who doesn't have mobility, to drop back behind a shaky offensive line time and again to drive the length of the field against this pass rush, I think that model can work. And I think that's – if they can get it to work that way even for just a game, uh, I think that'll build a, a lot of momentum toward creating that identity that, that players seem to really want and that this team has lacked this season. Jalen Hurts is a good good way to get back into some of the reasons for the decision. I, I was looking back, and I'm going to write something on this, but I, I was looking back to what Shane said um, about when they were going through the draft and what mattered the most to him. And, you know, he talks about – uh, here I'm, I gotta find. I'm just gonna do the exact quotes for you guys instead of paraphrasing it. It's just better. Um, to the question of how do you find a QB, he said there's certain characteristics. I've said this before, but just the guys that love love playing that position, love the grind, and they love the process. They have a chance to be successful. Um, and then that's not the that's not the most important one because I don't think he I don't think he would say that about Anthony. But it's this gets to uh, this gets to some of what what Steichen said today. Um, again, it's do they love it? Do they love the process? Can you take it to another level with these guys? Um, the guys that put in the time and the work and the effort, it's going to pay off at some point. Jalen was the type of guy that put in so much work. I was like, there's no way this guy's going to fail. The process he went through every single day to get his mind and body ready to play, it was special to see. So this is where I want to go with this because Steichen said that one of the things that Richardson had to learn or, or that they wanted him to learn over these last two weeks and the, and the benching sort of kind of grabbed his attention is the best way I can put it, um, is that – and Steichen was sort of careful to say that he – it's not like Richardson was lazy. He did not – like he didn't – he said over and over again, Richardson's a high-character guy. Jalen Hurts, if you're talking about Jalen Hurts but having a process week to week, Think about Jalen Hurts' college career. He was the starter at Alabama for two years, right? Yeah. Uh, got benched for Tua Tagovailoa. Had to find a way back 
at Oklahoma and get himself back to the point where he could be a second round draft pick. That's a lot of experience at a high level program in high level games and a lot of adversity. That's different than Richardson has faced adversity with not playing the first two years at Florida. It's not the same as playing and getting benched for somebody else at a program like Alabama. It just isn't. Richardson was inexperienced when they got him. Everyone knew this. He was, he was a player with only one year as a starter. Um, and so does it make some sense that, like, I think what Anthony said today was you can feel like you're working and doing everything you can, but then you 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 need something like this to help you realize you've not, you're, you're not quite doing everything you can. I mean, there's got to be more sacrifice, that kind of thing. It, like, you know, I, I think that's fairly easy to see just given the lack of experience he had you know, at a major college football program versus somebody like Hertz, you know, Hertz, Hertz is a guy who had been through an awful lot. Same. How long did Justin Herbert start at Oregon? Uh, It's multiple years. Yeah. You know, it's multiple years. Like that's, that's one of the things that that you talk about with the experience and you don't understand, like you understand what the experience you learn probably a little bit more what you're going to need to do. Uh, and I mean, the other thing with Herbert, I'm having to look all this stuff up on the fly. I apologize to the listeners. They switched coaches. <laughs> yep. They switched coaches. He went to he went from uh, Chip Kelly to Willie Taggart, and then he went to Mario Cristobal in his first three years at Oakland at Oregon. Um, yeah, that's Jalen Hurts. That's, that's switched a different teams. level of work you had to learn. Yeah, Jalen Hurts switched teams. He was so he was the front man of two different playoff teams. So there's a lot of adjustment there. There's a lot of things you learn. I think it's just more like learning the sort of walk and talk of being the franchise quarterback. Like I, I just, I, you know, I flew down to Gainesville twice to kind of study Anthony Richardson's backstory, and so. <laughs> Uh, everything I've gathered, and I still fully believe this, is that I think he loves football as much as many of these guys. But it gets packaged a different way where a lot of this is sort of like it's how you go about loving it. So Jalen Hurts, I think because of, of some of the on-field adversity he'd faced being benched at Alabama, I think from growing up in Nick Saban's program and the certain standard and discipline you grow up with within that, I think that wired him to be kind of that – more steely reserved stoic show up and put in a thousand hours at the facility dialed in you know very serious demeanor type approach and then he played that way anthony richardson's approach to football has always been that this is the place that gives him joy because it came to him at a time when he didn't have a whole lot else to go and do with himself. I mean, he was his his mom was gone working two jobs, and he and his brother would hop a black fence in sweltering Gainesville to go throw a ball on a patchy grass field. That's how he got to learn this game, and then it, it became this this kind of vehicle for him to rise above those circumstances. But for him, that has always been a, an outlet of joy. And I think when he goes in these settings, and they kept bringing up these different environments, Shane did today these different environments. He's in meeting room, weight room. Uh, film room, practice field, game field. It's like all these environments, he tries to be that kid because that to him is tapping into the base motivations in, in the most authentic way that he can most confidently deploy a skill set that's willing to throw 300 pound men off of his back uh, and live and not live in his fears with injuries and all that stuff. But the problem is that that demeanor, it just has to get packaged a little bit different. Uh, at the NFL level, it's you, you just can't be can't be jokey all the time. And here's an example, a concrete example to give you from that Texans game. Of course, everyone goes to the tap out, which is certainly you could say an effect of some of this. Not knowing for sure that was a that was a big learning moment. But there's another moment in that game that showed me a window into what's going on, which is he had had a he, he had a negative run in that game where he was on the ground and he just stayed on the ground like in the fetal position until Ryan Kelly came over to check on him, and then he popped back up and laughed. And this has been something he's always done. He did that in runs in, in high school when – I mean, he played in high school with his buddies from the 
from the neighborhood who, who went through the trenches with them. But that isn't the way that you can display yourself all the time at the NFL level, especially with a team that has lost you for uh, half a season to shoulder, three fourths of a season to a shoulder injury that had just <clears throat> just lost for two games or a hip injury. It's not funny to them when you're doing that in the middle of a game. And that's just something he has to kind of grow up and learn. And that was, you know, he is still younger than Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels. He's younger than some of the quarterbacks in college right now. And then he just hasn't had this path. He didn't go to the elite eight, elite 11 camps like CJ Stroud or Bryce Young. He didn't grow up. Uh, his high school was very much, you know, trying to try to make it through kids from uh, a lot of kids from that section eight neighborhood that, you know, they, they found the love of football together, but their love of football was kind of that, that brotherness and that jokiness. And um, so he's got to find his way here. It's going to be a fascinating, I think, transformation to watch unfold now that he realizes how important some of these things are. And we'll see how these lessons play out for him because I, I it's not going to work if he just comes in there and fakes it. Like if he comes in there tomorrow trying to just undress people, this team knows who he is enough through through – a year and a half of being his teammate that they know that's not authentic to him at the same time he can't do the exact same demeanor that he did before the benching so he's going to have to find a way to tap into his joy uh that, that lets him play free and all of that without displaying the optics of of not taking this job seriously enough uh so i think there's a lot of little steps in the meeting rooms and in weight rooms to kind of recenter himself that they've been working on these past two weeks we'll see if two weeks was enough to relearn that we'll see how that holds up when you are under the stress of week to week trying to get this team to the playoffs but that's going to be the big transformation here there's kind of two storyline story arcs going on with him the on-field ability to grow in accuracy and consistency and all of that with that sort of off the field or in the building demeanor growth as a human being these kind of two player personality trajectories that uh he's tap tapping into it's like I, I did a profile of him heading into his rookie season where i said they they've they they're taking a bet on the most athletic quarterback prospect the league has ever seen and they're asking him to grow up faster than any 20 year old has ever been asked to before and that's been hard so far this has been a, like a dip a pause in the process and we'll see if he's able to work through it and that's that's that huge climb he's going to have to make as a boomer bust prospect. But if he does, it still goes back to all those things we said at the beginning of the same bet, similar in a different, differently packaged way on Josh Allen, that if you actually hit that low percentage outcome, that is the ceiling, that ceiling is high, as high as anybody in this league. Um, you know, the behind the scenes stuff, Shane didn't, I don't think he explicitly gave like examples of spots where that was showing up in the game, but like I mean if if this was a, if it was a situation where I, I what I'm trying to say is I don't think that he would bring that up if it was like they just don't like his demeanor in it, and then he does everything right on game day or everything to a normal level on game day. I think there were probably things that were missed or miscalled or maybe a check that wasn't made um, or a check that was made and shouldn't have been. You know, like I, I think that there was probably some stuff that they could say, okay, this is something we wrapped over and over again or talked about over and over again, and it didn't get, it didn't get picked up. Why was that? Um like I said, Steichen didn't say that, but like, you know, you just him saying over and over again, the little things, the details, the constant grind, the meetings with the note taking that that's an ex, that's a exact quote there. I'm reading it. Walkthroughs, laser focus all the time. I think that that probably. Um, well, Stephen Holder asks, I assume there's a direct carryover between those things and what you do on Sunday. And Shane said 100% because I do believe in the preparation. The preparation's got to be at a premium. I I think that's the, the sort of the unsaid piece of this is probably that whatever they felt like he wasn't doing, there was inconsistency in his play from a, a standpoint that you just don't – I don't think you see on TV. You probably don't see from the press box in a way that you can 
definitively point to. Yeah, and I think the the idea of moving to Joe Flacco was on that specific front, it was going to be the total opposite as far as knowing how to study all those little steps during the week, knowing exactly how to put together this, this mental game plan, and then seeing it before it comes in the game as far as pre-snap, you know, adjusting the blitzes, seeing a lot of open players and completing the passes or attempting the passes at least. The issue for them was that's kind of all they were getting out of Joe Flacco, no explosiveness, still erratic ball placement, no mobility. And so it all kind of fell apart to where it wasn't a good enough lesson to say, look at all this stuff he put in and like, look at the results. The results are terrible. And so even though the process, a lot of it was probably pretty good, you know, they're kind of trying to play this in between where they say, hey, this process stuff was still good. Learn from that. But they didn't get the examples to show him of this is how it actually turns into success on game day. So that's still a part he's going to have to learn and experience for himself. And that's where you hope, though, like we, they talk all the time about like the light going off for a player. It's like sometimes you have to get to a point where all this comes together and that process that they drill down, that they actually they have to finally believe in that process um and then see it result and once it once you have that big game and they can point to look we we worked on all this stuff and look how you spotted the blitz early and look how you knew this guy was going to come open and all this stuff then they sort of have this this positive momentum within themselves to kind of carry that forward so i think that's what they're going to be searching for right now is 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 how do they get there and it's it's tricky because it's is two weeks enough to teach that Probably not, but I also think that like they're just back. They're they need to if they're not. They need to be back on the train of he's going to have to learn through reps, or at least you're going to learn about him through reps. Because they said today, you know, I asked him, I asked Shane Steichen, are you do you, are you, do you fear that he's going to look over his shoulder, given that he's been benched? And he said, no, we've made it very clear to him that he is the starter for the rest of the season. They've not kept all their promises on this front so far. I think they have to keep that one. And they have like they they're out back on the roller coaster. They got to stay. And like I said, the worst case scenario needs to be they learned about him. Maybe they learned he's not the guy. But they 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 got to go through these lessons on the field. And they took their one two week pause. And it's 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 either going to work out for them or it's not. Yeah, I've had several people ask me. So this is this is done now, right? It's over. We we've, we've taken care of it. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, you know, they said, Shane said, uh, like the day of the Texans game, Anthony's our quarterback. There's a whole bunch of stuff. I wrote a story on it that, you know, honestly felt pretty dumb the next day when they're the next two days when they make the change. Um, same thing this week. Uh, after Monday's press conference, everyone was like, well, he de definitively said they're going to stick with uh, – with Joe Flacco there, now Anthony Richardson is the starting quarterback. So I it's like we we can't really talk in like like we can tell you what they've said, you can look at what they said. That stuff has gone the other way enough times now that I don't blame you if you're going, I'm gonna take that with a grain of salt. Now, from a standpoint of what they should do, if Joe Flacco doesn't give you the best chance to win, which I think you and I laid out earlier in this podcast is pretty clear, then what they should do is figure out with Anthony Richardson. This is where I get back into the timing thing. I do think this sped up the timing on the evaluation a little bit. Like, I think that if he plays really bad down the stretch, um, I'm not talking about like, Showing flashes. I'm talking about like if he plays bad. I think you're less likely to go into next offseason feeling like, okay, he's the guy, than you would have been if you hadn't benched him. Oh, I yeah. do think it. I do think it moves up the timetable a little bit. Yeah, they've introduced enough doubt in a situation where until the benching, all they were trying to do was eliminate any possibility of doubt. Like this was the risk they took by taking the benching on is you know, they're going to tell him all this about you're back. You're the guy. You can't undo the benching and what that showed already, that there was a step of doubt in there. There's a seed of doubt in there. I think that came to light with Anthony today. Someone asked him like, did you always believe that you would 
come back and be the starter and that this was temporary. And he said, I didn't know what to believe. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the feeling I got out of him. And they ended up a couple of days after the benching, sitting him down for 30 to 45 minutes to really try to talk through this. And so there has been mixed messaging, not just externally with the public and explain it, but enough internally, at least in terms of that, that faith level about it. So, yeah, I think, I think they're going to have to build, they're going to have to really build something in this second half because you're right. If he had played his full first year and it just, or, or if he played this full season and it just wasn't great numbers, we could still kind of point to the Josh Allen model and say, well, like if they said they wanted, they fully believed in him, even if they had a bad year, we could say they're still in the Josh Allen mindset. Look, they believed in it and they were just going to see however it went into year two and year two, it got, you know, better. And then it really took off in year three. That's a harder sell when they've already made one decision to bench him so far. Uh, it's harder to sell internally, externally to Anthony, to Shane. Like it's hard to get any of the people to fully believe that. So these do become really critical games, you know, for a team that wants to make the playoffs. But I think even more important than that, trying to find some belief that this is uh, your long-term player, which we've seen the flashes in terms of does he have that high-level skill set? Again, first quarterback in the history of football with four rushing touchdowns in his first three games, longest non Hail Mary completion in the history of next-gen stats. So he has done those Josh Allen level you know, trait type ta- flashes. But what we're going to have to see in these final seven games is that other stuff come together. Some of the we have to, they're going to have to measure on their own since they're with him every day. Is the demeanor better? Is the focus level better? And then we're probably going to have to see some, we're going to need to see them things on the field where he's not going 10 of 32, where he's not, I mean, he's not going to turn into a 65% passer, but can he be over 50% in a lot of these games? Can he make the right reads most of the time? Can he get better ball placement if it's not perfect? You know, like, they're going to have to get in there. And I just, I really think this is going to have to be an effort from everyone involved, everyone. I mean, this is going to have to be, obviously that we laid out all the areas that Anthony needs to grow and, and learn from this benching. But I think Shane Seikens going to have to lean on the strengths of his personnel on offense with Jonathan Taylor. They should be writing Jonathan Taylor like till the wheels fall off this season. That is why you paid him the third most of any running back. And it, there's never been a time he's been more needed than right now when they're not built to be a passing game. Um, and then it's going to come down to other players. A.D. Mitchell continue, carrying forward his good game. Josh Downs staying out there and being that guy that he's he's been, but his quarterback really needs to build accuracy. Alec Pierce delivering on the splash plays when you do get them. Uh, and then, you know, Michael Pittman Jr., you hope, can come back and – start to tap into a good the good seasons that he normally has like this it's 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 all going to have to come together here and then like the defense keep in special teams keeping up the solid play they've had for the past five weeks so that there are games where maybe when he is not high completion percentage when he does make a bad turnover that you still have a chance to go win that game you can make corrections off of a victory this is like the, the, when when quarterbacks make it as top 10 picks in this league, it is almost always because they all help each other out. And the ones that bust, I think it's a mix of everybody dragging each other down. So we're going to see which of those they are going forward. I do think there are some guys who just aren't cut out for it. And you find out the NFL level and no amount of support or whatever would have helped. Um, but yes, usually, usually when a player, um, doesn't make it. There's, there, you could see some stuff around them that's gone wrong too. Uh, and, that's, and just real quick, that's my argument of put him in the Jalen Hurts playbook. And if he fails in that, then you gave it your shot, and you know you gave him the chance Jalen Hurts had. But I just, I really don't want to see them go back out there, have him drop back 37 times in a game, Jonathan Taylor touch it five times after halftime, and sit the whole fourth quarter. Like this has, he's got to make all these incremental fixes that they've laid out and drilled into them these two weeks. And they have to do their part. And I just want to see them try the model that they said they were going to use for him. Um, you know what else would help uh, them to do a run first playbook? 
Better backup running back. <laughs> yeah. Yep. This is an Anthony Richardson podcast, but I had to get that out. No, that's that's absolutely fair. Like when we talk about everyone doing their part, the the, the roster building has to be there too. And that's been part of the issue of why the move to Joe Flacco failed is that they didn't have tight ends and running backs to throw to. And when he had his run with the Browns, that was a huge part of what he did. His number one leading receiver is Mario Cooper. Number two was David Njoku, Pro Bowl tight end. And his number three option was Jerome Ford out of the backfield. So two of those three options weren't even options here. And then with Michael Pittman's injury, that wasn't an option either. So the roster has not delivered either so far. So it's like some of the, but that's what, like, they're not going to make those changes this season to the roster. I trade deadlines passed. Like it's, it's just the guys that they are betting on are going to have to do more. A.D. Mitchell, carry forward your good game, be more consistent. And yeah, I mean, I, the other parts are hard. I don't know that their backup running backs and their tight ends are going to just become something that we haven't seen them be, but you do hope maybe like the, I don't know. You hope that like the young offensive linemen can grow through playing and playing together. And they're just going to have to make incremental improvements and get Michael Pittman Jr. Back out there and actually like get him on a path to get healthy because him catching one pass, two passes a game, that doesn't really raise the bar for the passing game. But if they can get him, closer to like 80 percent plus health if they can get them on that that path again that would be very useful for i think any quarterback to have that guy that can win press man coverage and who kind of feels like he's open when he's not even open i'm gonna be mad about the backup running back thing all season <laughs> yeah it's, it's gonna not uh, me all season. You, you with that is me with safety but for kind of a different reason because like the running back floor has fallen completely to where there's like nothing there. And my big thing is I wanted, I just want a difference making safety where it's like they're getting fine enough play there, but yeah, there's, there's, there's approaches that we talked about all off season that could have this team in a better position, whether it's supporting the quarterback or just having the type of team that can make the playoffs, even with some erratic quarterback play, which they're getting out of both options right now. The good news is at least there's something to evaluate going forward now. So oh. instead of watching the Husk of Aaron Rodgers play the end of Joe Flacco, you get to see the Husk of Aaron Rodgers <laughs> play uh, Anthony Richardson, who may or may not be uh, the Colts quarterback of the future. Shane Sykin said he was the quarterback of the future today, but I think, I mean, obviously he's got to prove that. He's got to show improvement. He's got to be a better player. Um Going back to him this quickly does help. Yeah. Like going, I do think going back to him quickly helps. It's it's better than if he sat for seven games, eight games, and he gets thrown back in there. It's even better than him going back with an injury because they made a definitive decision to go back to him as opposed to being forced to make the decision to go back to him. Yeah. I mean, the, it's hard to credit them too much for timing because I think a lot of the timing to get here has been very confusing and odd. But I will say for, for, what they're deciding right now as far as when do we bring him back, this had to be the time for it because they're going into a game that he he may be he may look the same that he did before. This is a winnable game, though. This is not the world on his shoulders type of game yet against the dumpster fire that is the New York Jets, where 17 points might be good enough to win. It's I thought like if they if they and also the team's four and six, so like they can sell it to everybody internally and externally that, hey, we have a chance at the playoffs. This is not – and to him too, we're turning to you because we, we think you are ready after two weeks to help lead us to the playoffs. If they had waited a week and they lost to the Jets, you're four and seven, you couldn't beat the Jets, you're not probably a playoff team. If they went to him, say they beat the Jets, but they're getting housed by the Lions, they go to him at halftime. Or maybe they lose to the Lions and they throw him out there at four and eight. The message is, well, the Flacco thing blew up. We're not going to the playoffs. Let's like you just go out there and see what you can do. Like it's not a lot of faith. They got to pour faith back into this kid when they've kind of taken it away. Uh, again, we'll see how how clear that is. 
but I think this was the best way they could have gone about that. And you know what? We've been really hard on them and deservedly so over the past two weeks for just everything between the decision, flipping back on the original promise. Certainly the messaging has been rough, rough, rough for two weeks. But I remember something that uh, that a head coach told me years ago, and we were we were just a head coach I covered once. We were just pounding and pounding and pounding, and it was like an obvious decision out there that they were stubborn on. And then they went to it late. And I remember talking to this head coach and being like, "We were just like, why did you guys wait so long?" And he said, "You know what? You're going to make mistakes. I admit we made a mistake, but it's always better to make the right decision late than to never get there at all." And so that's kind of where I'm at with this decision. And again, that doesn't mean that it's going to work, but you're going to get the answers for it. And you went to him at a time when there is still a lane to the playoffs. There's a winnable game on Sunday. It's in his hands and you're going to see if he took these lessons and learned from it or he didn't. But this is, um, our podcast have been pretty dark here for a couple weeks. I think that's how we've ended every podcast is you saying these are getting really dark. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know where to go with that. This is kind of the most, this is probably the most hopeful I've been on this team since early in the season. I like this is their chance to, this is their chance to get a spark. We'll just see if the sparks fly or if they never catch fire. Ultimately the biggest problem with Flacco playing beyond him playing badly was that even if he played well, he's not the future. And Colts, most Colts fans, I think, want to see what want to know what the future is going to be they've they've been stuck in the present with no hope of with no future hope for a while and they'd like to have both i don't blame them i don't blame you guys you should want present and future you should and i think the players i can't promise you that the future is going to turn out the way you want it to yeah but i think the players (laughs) really exactly want both you know it hit me when like deforest buckner came out two days after the benching and we asked him his reaction and you could like feel his sigh and he shakes his head and he says, it's a quarterback carousel. Like it, it it was such a kind of haunting and jarring experience for this locker room to be right back in these fears of 2022 again. And just, just the unknown of it all. There was, there was complete unknown. Again, like you said, even if we laid all the scenarios out the day they made the benching, but like even the best case for Joe Flacco, where he is last year's Joe Flacco, Browns run, all of that again. There is no answer about the future and when they're off the carousel because he's turning 40 years old next month. And Josh Downs laid that out the day of it. You know, I asked him, like, do you believe Anthony Richardson will be the starter again? He said, I mean, Joe Flacco's 40 years old, so you know, I think we're gonna have to. I mean, it's just sort of like everyone was like, what? Where are we going? And I, I did the I do the mailbag every week, and it's I mean it's been all quarterback questions, but I got one question this week where someone said, What is the case for hope for Colts fans right now? And I think answering that question now is a lot different than if we answered it this morning. Because this morning there wasn't a real hope for the short term or the long term. Because the long term, who knows? And that's still true and until we figure this out. But the short term also the team they've been rolling out there with the offense they're playing, even if you somehow beat enough bad teams to get in the playoffs, they're not doing anything going on the road in the playoffs. The, the way that they played offense with Joe Flacco, they're just, there's not, and it may still be the case, but again, there's still a couple things that can happen. No matter, There's a couple of different avenues now for this season to be productive in some way. You could find your quarterback in the future, even if it's maybe not like fully, formed now you could at worst find out that he's not that guy they had to get clarity out of this season uh and i don't know i think if they stick on this and this is the other thing i that we have to bring up anthony richardson's got to stay healthy to get these answers and that's been a consistent challenge for him as well so this is a hopeful, I think, a, an, an interesting moment again, like a, a time to be entertained and interested in this team again. But it is going to be sort of a week-to-week monitoring of how patient they are and can he stay on the field uh, and, and be able to get these reps and, and be able to give us these answers. It's, I think we're going to be monitoring stuff like that every week. 
but at least we're on the roller coaster again. And that's uh, as someone who grew up near Cedar Point, that's kind of all I wanted. <laughs> I think Colts fans ultimately would like to be on the mountaintop. That's where they would. That's where they want to be going the roller coaster. But yeah, that's fair. Thing about but the thing about mountaintops is that you can't get there if you're old. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Oh, no. That was so mean. That was so mean. I'm sorry. I apologize to Jeff Black. <laughs> that was wonderful. Though. That's it for the Colts Cover 2 podcast. Um, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> for the Indy Star, I'm Joel Erickson. This That's is Nate ageism. Atkins. I will try to be better. Uh, I'll try to be better on Sunday night. <laughs>